Let's praise the Lord. Amen. Let's go straight to the Word of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 through 9. Romans 8, 5 through 9. And while you're looking for it, I want to thank the bishop and the first lady and the saints of God to allow me to speak to you tonight on this topic. And I hope I can give you something from the word of God, from God himself, to help you to live a life for God. Amen. Romans 8, verse 5 through 9. And it reads like this. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are comp controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. If your sinful nature controls your mind, there is death. But if the Holy Spirit controls your mind, there is a life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them are not Christians at all. Romans chapter 8, verse 9, 5, which is the living text, living Bible, new living Bible. Amen. Let's all pray. Father of God, we thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, O oh God, for bringing us here one more time to hear your words tonight. I pray, O oh God, you will touch me right now, Lord, O oh God, and help me, O oh God, to deliver a word from thee, O oh God, to your people. That, Lord, O oh God, we can be strengthened, O oh Father, O oh God. We can be led, O oh Father, O oh God, by your spirit tonight to live the life you call us to live. Help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may take your seats. Tonight, I want to speak on a simple topic, living the transformed life. And we are called to live a life of trans to, to be transformed in God. And I want to speak about two natures that dwell within mankind, which is the sinful nature and the spiritual nature. Now, psychologists have been asking for some time now if people are naturally good by nature or are they evil? They still can't come up with this answer, but the Bible says that our human nature is such that, uh, we said our human nature is such that while we are capable of great love, we also have an unspeakable history of brutality, rape, torture, murder, and war. So although we do, they say, well, we're good, we're naturally good, but we see in the world today where and we see people are still committing these sinful things and still say they are good. Um, Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And he wasn't speaking of that blood pump we have in our chest, but he's speaking about our heart, the seat of our conscience of who we really are. So what? It is desperately wicked. Without God, we are wicked. Can I say amen? Because we are nothing without God living within us. So if there is no God in us, then we have that sinful nature that we inherited from Adam in the fall. Now in Genesis, account of man, both male and female, were, were created in the image of God in Genesis 1 verse 27. So when God made man... Uh, male and female, he says he made them in his likeness and in his image. They were created in a sense of innocence and without sin, but they still have the capability to choose to disobey God or to obey God. So you see where they disobeyed God because it was in them. God made us with a free will to choose to obey him or not to obey him. So although they were made in an image of God, they still have a free will because God did not want to really have us to be like robots, to give us no free will to choose. So we just go behind and do what he say. He wants us to serve him out of our own willful desires, our own free will to choose him because he loved us so much and to show his love for us. That's why he made us in that way. 
But Adam failed to obey the single forbidden command that God gave him. Can you imagine? One single command. Thou shalt not eat from the tree in the midst or in the middle of the garden. Yet they failed to obey that one command and disobey the rule of God. Now, isn't that like man? We have all the things that we can do as Christians, as apostolics. And we always question, why can't we do this? Uh, when I was young in church growing up, I used to ask, why can't we go here? Why can't we do this? Now we have a bunch of stuff that we could do as Christians. But we pay attention to what we cannot do. And we go to, pl to the place where we should not even be. Now, Eve could have saved herself the temptation by not going to where the tree was. But because she was there, she made a provision for her flesh for the enemy to show up there and to speak to her right there in the garden. So if we stay away from things that we are not supposed to do, uh, we, we should not go, then we can save ourselves all the assets of temptations in this world. Do you believe that? But we try to go to places and because we're so curious, young people mostly, and I say, some old Christians are the same way too. We, we always bash the young people. But there are old folks who are still the same way in their curiosity to try to live on the edge, see how far they can get before they fall over. But I want to live as close as I can to God so I will not fall over no edge because I'm afraid of ice for one, so I will not go to the edge of anything to look over. When I was younger, ice did not scare me. But the older I get, the more I'm afraid of heights. But that's Bible because Solomon did say that young men remember now your creator in the days of thy youth before the evil days draw nigh. Now it's poetry. And it means the evil days were not evil as sinful days, but it was really old age. He said the older you get, you're going to be afraid of heights. So I'm in the Bible. So I'm afraid of heights right now. So... Adam sold us into slavery for a bite of a forbidden fruit, and now we have the sinful nature warring against the spiritual nature in us. Now, we were created in the image of God, but when Adam sinned, we read where Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own image, after his image, our, and he called his name Set. Genesis 5 and verse 3. So when he fell, now he have set in his own sinful nature. So sinful nature was passed on to all human beings or humankind after Adam's sin in the garden because now we were born into sin and shaped into iniquity when the fall took place in the garden. So now every human being that comes after the fall are born into sin and shaped in iniquity and we are doomed to a sinful nature. So that nature is in us now, our, should I say was in us, because now we're apostolics, it's still in us, but we, it's a war that's going on within us. But if we live the life we're supposed to live according to biblical principles, then we can have our spiritual nature become much more stronger to dominate our sinful nature, and we can live for God more effectively. Now, every man, our human beings have the propensity to do sinful deeds. You don't really have to train a young child to lie or to steal. Two-year-old kids, they pick up things that they should not pick up, and when you come across them, they're hiding. Why are they hiding? Because they know within themselves that what they're doing was wrong. So they came from the womb knowing, and these days, the kids I see coming out now, is that two-year-olds seem to be like the 10-year-olds these days. Not like when I was growing up, but a baby was a baby. Now a baby seems to be an adult today. I don't know, it's like we, we, we just evolved into this thing where they become like adults overnight. So they are not, they're not trained to lie. Now Romans 7 and verse 17 says, The law is good then, but the trouble is not with the law, but with me, because I am sold into slavery with sin as my master. So he said he, we were sold into slavery, and sin became our master for a while. 
But now that we are saved and we are apostolics, then sin should not be our master. Amen? Because we are no more under that sinful nature that we used to have before we got saved, before Christ came into our lives, unless we are still living in the old way, not being transformed. Now, we were dead in our sins and trespasses, but thank God for Jesus. He came and liberated us and gave us the life that we live. So now we live a life in God that we can live free from sin because we have Christ within us. Now, I've always said I prayed every day that what 1 John says, that a man who is truly born of God sinneth not. When I look into truly born of God, and we have to come to a place where we are truly born of God because it is nature, his divine nature, the seed remains within us. So he prevents us not to sin. So if someone, I said, keep on sinning every time, my question is, are you truly born of God? With Instagram, we may fall sometimes. Yes, we do, but we don't keep on sinning. Like some people might say, I am a sinner saved by grace. I beg to differ. I was a sinner saved by grace because to be a sinner is a continual thing. I'm sinning every day, so I'm no sinner saved by grace. I don't know about you, but that's not my philosophy. I, I was a sinner saved by grace, living for God right now and going on to be with him soon. The book of Galatians 5 and verse 17 says, the old sinful nature loves to do evil, which is just opposite from what the Holy Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desire that are opposite from what the sinful nature desires. That Spirit is our Holy Spirit, gives us the desire. Those two forces are constantly fighting each other. And your choices are never free from your or, or this conflict. But when you are directed by the Holy Spirit, you are no longer subject to the law. So if the, our Holy Spirit is now in us and guide us, we are no more subject to the old nature. Do you believe that? Now, it is easy to be conformed to church rules, worship styles, dress code, and still not be transformed. Because you got some Christian circles where they look like Christians, because they dress like Christians, they talk the talk, they have the worship down, but inside there is no transformation. So we're not talking about being conformed to Christianity, but be transformed and living a transformed life because I must be transformed from the inside out. To be conformed means from the outside, but the inside is still not changed. So if we are apostolics, we are transformed from the inside. And we live as apostolics according to biblical principles and the Holy Ghost direction in our lives and be transformed by him. Now, our sinful nature. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things become New. So when we came into Christ, all the old sinful nature should be gone. Is it? We'll discuss it later. Because that's what we believe sometimes. Now, this is a misconception that when we become in Christ or believe that because we were baptized and received the Holy Ghost, that the old sinful nature was eliminated. Is that true? No, it's not. It's still there. Now, to become a saint takes time. Do you believe that? It takes time to build or to make a saint out of a convert. So it's a progress to go through. As we live for God, we go through a progress, and we go through a process to become like Jesus. But we want to be like Jesus, so that sinful nature has to be put under subjection of the Holy Spirit of the new man that's within us that God gave us when we became saved. Do you believe that? Now, it will take a renewal of mind by the word of God for us to be transformed. So our minds have to be renewed. Our sinful heart that we have, 
No wonder David said when he sang, create in me a clean heart. Don't really refurbish my heart I have, but give me a new heart. A new heart and give me the right spirit because I want to live for you because he knows our heart is desperately wicked. And the Bible says, who can know it but Jesus alone? That's why I said, search me, O Lord. So there are times I got to say to the Lord, search me, Lord, because I don't know what's really in me until you search me and show me what's in me. And sometimes when God shows us what's in us, we are so surprised. Are you surprised when God shows what's in you? Sometimes we go through some difficulties and we see what's really what's in us. But we have to go through these things so God can reveal what's in us so we can come out of what we are to become like him and more like him. That's why we don't despise when we go through our times and trials because those only come to make us stronger and to show us where we are lacking in God. I need to be improved in God. Do you believe that? Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, everybody always say, what is God's will? How do I know God's will for my life? And I've always said, go to the word of God. You will know God's will by you reading God's word and see what he says. And be conformed by the renewing of your mind, by the word of God. And then you will prove what is God's perfect will for your life. So praying, God, I want to be in your will. Show me your will. We're not going into his word. You will not come into God's will for your life. Praying is good. I don't be against, I love to pray. I pray every day. I have my own prayer place where I go to at home. But you can never pray effectively until you know what God says in his word to pray. Because when you pray, you're praying God's word back to him. We don't pray and twist God's arm, but we pray his word. So until we know his word for what he says for our lives, then we can pray more effectively. Do you believe that? So we have to be renewed in our minds by the word of God. And it will take a constant, steady diet of the word of God. Not some word today and then some word next week, but steadily, consistently, Eating the word of God every day, a consistent diet of God's word. And you know what God have to say to us. When I go into God's word, I say, God, now I want three things from you, Lord, when I open this Bible. I want you to shine your light. Illumination. Shine your light on this word right now, Lord. Then I want God to do what? He has to give me a revelation. Reveal what your word is saying to me now so I can know what the word of God is saying to me and help me to apply it for application. Because if I know God's word and don't apply it, it makes no sense anyway in my life. So I must apply God's word to my life. So it takes a consistent diet. Who eat twice a day, once a day, or once a week? Natural food. Nobody, right? I love to eat morning, noon, night, late at night. I got snacks in between. The word of God should be the same thing. Do you believe that? What I do, I buy me a CD package in my truck. And when I'm driving, I have a long drive from Pasco County to work every day in, in, nearby in Brandon there. And I play a tape every day with the Bible. And when I'm driving, I don't listen to no other kind of music or whatever. I play the word of God. And it plays in my mind and get in me every single day because it's the word of God that will take me from her to heaven. I can only know how to live for God if I know what God say in his word. So I desire his word every day so I can grow in him. Now, 1 Peter 2 in verse 1 through 2 says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies, and envies, and evil speaking. Now, he's speaking to Christians to lay aside all these things. Now, if I have all these things in my life, I'm still in my sinful nature. I'm still not transformed to my spiritual nature, right? But here he goes. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word of God, why? That he may grow thereby. 
if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So if you taste and see that God is good, desire, he says, the sincere milk of the word of God, because only the word of God, that's our milk to grow. Now, I know any baby in here who don't drink milk will soon die. Soon. Right? So as newborn babes in Christ, when we come into God, we decide the sincere milk of the word of God so we can grow. And as we grow, now we get some more meat on the bones to chew on. But we have to desire the sincere milk because we have to grow by the milk of the word of God and grow up in Jesus and don't be babies all the time. Because we can't be babies all the time. Because we are in a building mode. And we want to save more souls to come in. And if we're all babies, who will feed the other babies? Now we want revival to come to Tampa Bay City and to New Life Tabernacle. The wise man says, the more ox you have in the pen, the more poo you're going to clean up. Paraphrase. So the more babies you come into the church, is it more crying going to be on our shoulders? Is it more noses we're going to wipe? Is it more issues going to come to us? But we have to be grown up in God, in the word of God, so when they come, we can take care of them. We can minister to them. Because the bishop alone and us as ministers can't take care of all the babies coming into church. So we want everyone to grow up in God, so when they come, we can deal with all the issues that's coming at us. Do you believe that? That it's coming. Believe it or not, it's coming. Revival is coming to New Life Tabernacle. Now, Psalms 19, verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So the word of God will come to convert souls. So as they come and hear the word of God, they're going to be converts coming in. And even us who are still in the church, Converting our soul and making wise the simple. Now, that no means our human wisdom now. Or wise in God, in the word of God, right? Wise in God. And we need folks to grow up in God and become the nurturers that we should be when they come. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness or excess of naughtiness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. So that word of God is able to do what? Save our souls. So it, someone cannot be saved until they hear the word of God. Do you believe that? They have to hear the word of God to be saved. It's able to save their souls. But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Because if I hear the word of God and don't do the word of God, I don't deceive the bishop, the bishop when he preaches and, and I hear but don't do it, I deceive my own self. Right? Do you believe that? Deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man building his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way. And straightway forget it what manner of man he was. But also look it into the perfect law of liberty and continue it therein. He be not a forgetful area, but a doer of the word. This man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, when I open the word of God, that's my mirror. And I know when you guys were coming to church today, you got dressed before a mirror. I don't have no hair to look at in the mirror, but I got to watch my tie and everything. But for the ladies, make sure your hair is good. Your clothes look good, right? Your face is good. Nothing in your eyes, right? Now, if you look in the mirror and see those things, I don't take care of them. And you come outside, how will you appear to people? Same way with the word of God. If I look into the mirror of God's word and see that God is saying to me that, Rich, that's in your life, that's no good. Follow what this word is saying over here. But I go away and don't do what the word of God say to me. I am only deceiving my own self. So we can't be looking in the word of God, but don't do what the word of God say. We have to obey. We will have to read the word of God every day. Meditate on the word of God every day. 
Now, how many read the word of God and when you drive and you meditate on the word of God? You're in your car or on a job and you're just having that word going over and over in your mind and in your spirit. We have to also ingest or consume, swallow the word of God and digest to absorb or assimilate the word of God, then apply it to our lives. If we don't do those things, then we can never live the transformed life that God called us to live, the overcoming life that God said we should live in him if we don't consume the word of God in that way. Reading the word of God for information's sake only does not mean that we will be transformed. Now, there are some who can quote scriptures, Matthew 5 and verse 6, and they can tell what it says, and they can quote all these scriptures, Romans 10 and verse 10, and they talk about the raise your hand and all, but they're not conformed inside, are transformed inside. They are conformed to what the word of God is saying to them, but transformation is far from their hearts. So we can't read for head knowledge alone. It must be from my head to my heart. And a good seed, the Bible says, is the, those who hear the word of God according to one gospel writer and understand the word of God. That's Matthew. The Mark says, he who hear and receive the word of God. That's the good ground. And here comes Luke now. He who hear and receive and, and keep the word of God. So I must first understand the word of God, receive the word of God, and keep the word of God for it to be of any effect in my life. Those three things have to take place in my life. Otherwise, I will not be living the life. I will live in only going to the motion. I'm too old to go to the motion of church. I'm too near to God's coming. I've come too far by faith to lose my way in God right now. So I've got to conform and transform to the image of God from the inside out and also from the outside conform to his image and look like him. So when they see me coming, they don't see me, but who they see? On your jobs, they should see who? At schoolhouses, should see who? So the old nature has to die. Do you believe that? Now, what people see on the outside is only what's in the inside. Do you believe that? So one of the wise men said to keep or to guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it, that's Proverbs 4 and verse 23, out of it are the issues of life. So what comes out of us, how we live our lives, how we talk and how we walk, it's coming from where? From within. We can't have sinful nature within us and produce outside spiritual fruits. Doesn't happen. So you can tell a person when they open their mouth who they are. The wise man says, a fool will seem wise in his own eyes if he keep his mouth shut. But once he opens his mouth, you can tell who he is, what's in him. Because what's in us will come out eventually. It will come out. Jesus Speaking to the Pharisees in Matthew 12 and verse 34, he says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So when we're speaking, when somebody do something to me, like cut me wrong and tell me sorry, I always say, you ain't sorry. That's in your heart. You meant what you said because it's coming from your heart, not from your lips. The Bible says, if we can speak and don't hurt somebody else, we are a perfect man. So if I speak to earth you, I'm still going towards perfection. Because if I speak, I should be able to build you up and lift you up. My words should be seasoned with salt to encourage you and to build you up and not tear you down. So if you tear me down, I can say, that's in your heart. I need to be put under the blood and be conformed to his word. Do you believe that? Now, we can all be in a church service like this. We can hear the same word of God, and yet we live contrary to what was said tonight. Jesus speak about two men who build houses. And he says, 
one man built his house on the sand, and one built his house on the rock. And when the storm came, only one house stayed standing. Now, if you read that story there in Matthew 12 or Matthew 7, you will see where they both heard the same word. They both got the same information. But it's what they did, what they heard that makes a difference. One went out and built his house upon the sand, although he heard what Jesus says, because Jesus says, those who hear these sayings of mine and do with them. So he said we, that they hear the same thing. So not everyone, he says, in the same chapter there that said, Lord, Lord, shall enter. But who say, hear the sayings of mine and do with them. So what he was saying, if you hear what I'm saying to you now in Matthew 7, and you do all this, what I'm saying here in this chapter here, you are likened unto a man who built your house upon a rock. But if you don't do them, you are likened unto a man who built your house upon the sand, and it will tear down. When somebody falls from this gospel here and falls away from the church, it's because they were hearing and applying the word of God to their lives. If we truly apply God's word to our Christian walk with God, then we can't really fall away from the church. Do you believe that? But if we hear other false doctrines and other false teachings, and we mix everything into one big pot and apply it to our lives, we become very confused. And before you know it, we are gone away from the church. We fall away. Now, Ephesians 4 and verse 22 to 24 says, that he put on, or he put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that he put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So I've got to put off the old man. And then put on the new man. You can't put on that man for me. You can't put off my old man. This is an individual thing, walk with God. I can help you to walk the right roads. But individually, I've got to come to a time in my life when I say, Lord, I've got to be saved. I've got to walk right. I've got to talk right. I've got to apply these words to my life so I can live the life you call me to live. Yes, we are called to bear each other's burden and the weak's infirmities. But guess what? The Bible never asks me to take your burden from you. Help you bear it. Do you believe that? So you help me bear mine, I help you bear yours, and we can all grow up into Jesus. Do you believe that? Now, when somebody say they're saved, they're apostolics, they receive the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, and baptized in Jesus' name. But when you go on their Facebook pages, and you see all the old girlfriend pictures still, and the old walks of life they had before they got saved, I wonder if they're really truly born of God. I wonder if their sinful nature is still dominant in their life, and they haven't put off the old nature yet, and still in their sinful nature. When you become in God, you are a new creature in God. All things are passed away. All things become new in God. So if you were in the world before and you got all these things according to the world's style, when you go home, you clear off all those things off your computers. You burn those CDs. You burn those eight tracks you may have had. You put off all those things you know you should put off and put on a new man because once you keep those old things in your life, you will make a provision for the sinful nature. I know when I got saved, I was a young child when I got saved, but I walked away from the Lord. But when I got back into the Lord and I got renewed in God, I went home. I burned everything that I used to have before I came back to God. I burned them because I want no remembrance of it. I want to look to God and keep my mind on God and don't look back on the garlic and the onions in Egypt. I'm going forward in Jesus. Now, Romans 13 verse 14 says, 
but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And many times we make provision for the flesh. We go to places we should not even go. We, we engage in some conversation sometimes that we shouldn't even be engaging in. The Bible even says it's a sin to speak of those things that folks did in darkness. So when they come to me with those things, get away from me. Don't engage in those things. I am now a child of the living God. Now, we must control or better yet crucify the old nature and allow our new nature to grow and overcome the old nature. But the problem is we make provision too many a times for the flesh and expect to live the transformed life. Paul told the Galatians church in chapter 5, verse 16 through 17, this I say then, walk in the spirit and he shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusted after the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, to the other, so that he cannot do the things that he would. But if he be led by the spirit, he are not under the law. So most times we can do what we should do in God within our um, spiritual nature because we are making provision too many times for the sinful nature, for the flesh. Walking in the flesh still will prevent us from accomplishing what we should do in God in the spirit sense. So I must put off, mortify, I must kill, crucify the flesh so I can live in God. Do you believe that? And Paul also named a number of things that's in the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. He named a whole slew of stuff. So Paul now says to the Ephesians, Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit of God. Now, have you ever been drunk before, any one of you? I know you're apostolics. I many of us came from some places sometimes. I got drunk once. And I tell you, what I see from my eyes were not real. When I, when I walk and what I say was not real because you will see things that is not there. You are controlled by the spirit, that alcohol in you. Now, if you are controlled by God's Holy Spirit, then you have no control over yourself because you are walking in the spirit and it will control you instead of you controlling yourself. But we want to be in control so many a times so we don't allow God's Holy Spirit to control our lives so we can walk in the Spirit as we should. Do you believe that? So if then that, in, in, uh, he told the Colossians church in um, the third chapter, verse 1, if he then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sit on the right hand of God, set your affection where? on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead. I've never seen any dead person walking and talking. So if I'm dead to sin, I'm dead to my old life, then I can't walk again in my old self I used to walk in. No, I'm alive in Christ. I'm alive in God now, so I can walk as a living, breathing apostolic of God. Do you believe that? For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. And he goes, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, and he named fornication, and cleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which he also walk sometime when he live in them. But now, say now, he also put off all these. Now, he named these things, and you examine yourself right now. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image 
of him that created him. So if I'm still keeping malice, I'm walking still in my old sinful nature. If I'm lying to my brother or my sister, I am still in my old nature. Do you believe that? It's the word of God. So I've got to put off all these things and live for God. So if I find myself any time, you know, to be and doing all these things, I've got to realize I am walking still in my flesh. Amen? And I'm running out of time. So I'm going to stop very soon. I'm going to skip some stuff here. Now, in Romans 11, verse 30, Paul told the Quran, told them that the Gentiles were once rebels against God. And when the Jews refused the mercy of God, God had mercy on us. So because the Jews refused God's mercy, so now we, if we only know what God did for us on Calvary and his finished work on Calvary, then we will be prone to live for him. If we only understand what God did, the love he showed for us, or he died for us while we were yet in our own sins, in the image of the Adamic nature, God died for us. That's why when we come to God, we should be so joyful to be in God's house, to say like David, I was glad, I was glad to be here. I'm glad, I'm to say like David, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. And I will what? Dwell in God's house all the days of my life. If we only understand what God did for us, and God gave us all things according to his divine power, and given us unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. We have no excuse. We can live godly before God because we became partakers of his divine nature. So if we take on his divine nature, we can live like Christ lived without sinning. Can you believe that? How many believe we have to sin? I don't buy that. I can live. If I'm truly born of God, I can live. I'm getting there. I'm praying every day. Help me to get to the place in you where sin have nothing. Jesus says, here comes, to paraphrase the devil, or here they come. But he has nothing in me. So if there's no sinful stuff in me, I can live above temptation and above sin. And I will close with this. I got to skip this over. I don't want to really... Go off my topic. But I, I know David. He loved God's word so much. He loved God's house so much. And David says, I was glad when he said unto me, let us go into the house. And I got to look back and see, could this be why David said that? Can you pull up for me on the monitor there? Deuteronomy 23, verse 1 to 2. Deuteronomy 23, 1 to 2. He that is wounded in the stones, or out his private member cut off, shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. A bastard shall not enter into the God's congregation, right? Of the Lord, even to his tenth generation, shall he not enter into the God's congregation. Now, why am I reading that scripture here? I go way back to the book of Genesis, the 38th chapter. And that chapter seemed like it should not even be there. Because they were speaking about Joseph's lineage, or his story about Joseph. And God put that one chapter there in the middle of that story about Judah. And you all know the story of Judah. Oh, he slept with his, his daughter-in-law, Tamar who play to be an harlot, a prostitute. And you can see in the 29th verse of the 38th chapter, and the Bible says, and it came to pass because now she became pregnant. And the Bible says, and it came to pass as he drew back his hand, that behold, his brother came out, and she said, how that thou broken forth, this breach be upon thee, Therefore, his name was called Fares. Now, keep that in your mind, Fares, 
And when you go back to the book of Ruth and the fourth chapter, verse 18 to 22, it's giving you the lineage of David. And when you count them when you go home, from Pharez to David is 10 generations. Pharez was born as a bastard child to Tamar and Judah who slept with her. Now, David now could never have come into God's congregation until the 10th generation. No wonder he said, I was glad when he said unto me, let us, not let me, but let us, my generation, enter into God's congregation. And he loved God's house so much. He loved God's house so much. Desire God's word because if you read David's life and how God transformed David to be the man of God that he was, although he was a murderer, an adulterer, but God transformed him into become a man after God's own heart. That's why I don't give up on people who seem to be slowly transforming into God's image. Because I know it takes time. And that's why I've always been patient with people. Because I know that it will take some time for them to be transformed into God's image of who God is. And when I look on the Bible and see who God used to write the Bible, God inspired murderers like Moses and David and Paul, adulterers like David, a thief like Matthew. They wrote the book to God's inspiration. So who am I to judge somebody because they are not living according to how I think they should live? Not being conformed to what they should be transformed into the image of God very slowly. So we have to become very patient today with folks who are slow to be transformed and help them. And we need more Barnabas in the church today, encouragers in God, to encourage those who are still not being transformed into God's image. So my brothers and my sisters, I encourage you today to get in the word of God, study the word of God, eat the word of God, ingest it, digest it, that it become a part of you. And as the psalmist says, become a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your pathway. Because without the word of God, you're walking in darkness and you can't see where you're going. Be transformed into your spiritual nature. May God bless you.